the Arkansas Society of Freethinkers on the web at arfreethinkers.org or the most reliable way is by getting to know the members and organizers by coming to our events. Our calendar is on meetup.com. Just search for the Arkansas Society of Freethinkers. The Free Thought of the Day is a segment of our monthly program in which we look at a quote, an idea, or a concept that appeals to us as free thinkers. The Freedom from Religion Foundation has a web page that is devoted to the Free Thought of the Day. Every day they publish a couple of quotes, and one of the quotes they have today comes from Phyllis Diller. Um, Phyllis Diller was born on this day in 1917. Today would be her 105th birthday. By the time I was 10, I thought she was already 105, but I digress. Phyllis Diller was one of the first solo female stand-up comedians to become a household name. She was also an actress, an author, an accomplished pianist. I didn't realize that until I did a little research on her and a visual artist. Sometimes it seemed like she was everywhere on television, especially on game shows. And if I gave you a list of her voice acting jobs, you'd know her from shows like The Family Guy, Animaniacs, King of the Hill, Wild Thornberries, and many more. Um, she was best known for her self-deprecating humor and her eccentric stage persona. She had really wild hair and clothes and this exaggerated cackling laugh. The uh, quote that the Freedom from Religion Foundation put on their page today was from an interview she gave in 2001. She said, religion is such a medieval idea. Don't get me started. I've thought about every facet of religion and I can't buy any of it. Too many of us have bought it and were injured by its many, many manufacturing deficits. Some of us have never bought religion. So-called improvements to religion over the centuries have not improved it here in Arkansas. Surrounded as we are by its excited fans who use their personalized version as a bludgeon on the rest of us, we want nothing more than a full-scale recall so that everyone returns religion to the store and gets a full refund, and then we can get on with our lives without it. At each meeting, we invite a local free thinker to share a story about themselves. Today, I have the podium and I'm hogging it. Hello, my name is Ann and I am not a Christian. I'm not a Jew or Muslim either, and I'm not Buddhist or Hindu. I'm one of about a billion people who does not believe in either a single deity or a group of gods that created the world or that control or otherwise interfere with nature in the lives of human beings. I'm an atheist. I was born this way. Nothing's ever happened to change that. Even as a child, I was skeptical and I don't lightly identify myself as an atheist, but most of us who do identify as atheists don't do it lightly. Many, many of us have studied religion and found it lacking. Now, that's not to say that any of us disrespect the beliefs of others or disrespect their ability to have faith. One of the things I study when I study religion, and I have studied religion, is the effortless ability of other people to believe in the existence of a deity. I don't understand it from an intellectual point of view. Um, I... I have spent more time studying why people believe than what their beliefs actually are. I don't really understand it from a spiritual point of view. I don't understand the need. I recognize that a lot of people have a need to believe though in some sort of deity. As for me, I just don't possess that faith and I never have. I can't create faith inside of myself. I wish that when, when other people want to deny the faith or lack of faith of other people, that they'd stop and think a minute about how it feels for their own faith to be denied. My attitude towards religion has evolved over the course of my lifetime. 
when I was a little girl, I never felt part of religion. And I resented being made to waste an hour and sometimes two when mom made me go to Sunday school of a perfectly good day off from school. Um, I would rather have been riding my horse or reading a book. Now, there is a book that the Christians use, or at least allude to in their services. I'm sure we're all familiar with it. And during those long hours wasted in church as a child, I read that book. I read the verses that were part of the day's program, and I read the parts that came before and the parts that came after. And I concluded that the sermons based on those passages pretty much missed their mark completely. I'm a reader. As you can see behind me, I like books. I collect books. Fantasy has always been one of my favorite genres. That being said, I always knew that fairies and orcs weren't real and that climbable beanstalks reaching to the clouds with giants and golden egg laying geese at the top were complete fabrications. And I knew that there weren't portals to other dimensions. My ability to separate fact from fantasy and my innate skepticism led me, even as a small child, to think that adults who claimed to believe in miracles were just telling stories. I never understood how grown-ups who claimed to believe in miracles could think that those things were actually true. The more they insisted, the sillier I thought they were. I knew what dreams were. I dream, so I assumed they did too, but why would you think a dream is reality? To think that fantastical stories were anything other than exercises in imagination just seemed ridiculous to me. Now, when my son started school, my husband and I didn't go to church. Um, we agreed that our son ought to learn about the religion of his culture because he would grow up surrounded by Bible stories. Now, my sister and her boys were attending um, Park Hill Presbyterian. That's a small Presbyterian church in North Little Rock that was about 15 minutes from our house. So we started going there and taking our son. His cousins were there, so we figured that would be a safe place for him. And he started to learn the Bible stories that all the children learn eventually in church. We did not make him sit through sermons. We were not child abusers. Um, his father and I joined the young adult Sunday school class at Park Hill Presbyterian, and we made some great friends there. In fact, I'm still really good friends with two of the couples that were in that class that I met in that class. During that class, I never found any reason to hide my non-belief, and I enjoyed discussing the Bible and its philosophy with the other class members. I mean, they were some really smart uh mainline Christians. They weren't fundamentalists. They weren't evangelicals. They weren't crazy about it. Um, and, and some of them really wrestled with it. Um, I enjoyed picking apart the writings of Peter and Paul, especially in the face of current religious practice and the atmosphere around us. This was in the mid to late 90s. So, you know, um, it wasn't quite as bad as it is today. It was getting there, though. Now, the class read C.S. Lewis's screw tape letters, and I don't know if you're familiar with that book, but it's essentially the devil writing to figure out how to tempt people into sin or whatever. Um, and I was the good natured butt of a lot of jokes while we were reading that, and frankly, I enjoyed it. Um, I was never disrespectful to my Sunday school classmates about their beliefs, and they weren't disrespectful of my belief or my non-belief as it was. Now, one day the minister of that Presbyterian church decided to visit our Sunday school class, and he wanted to lead the discussion. That day, it was a small church, so we all knew him. He knew us, and um, the thing is, he and I had never really talked about religion, and it was kind of weird because suddenly there was somebody who I wasn't sure was safe in that space and who didn't know about my lack of belief. So as the discussion progressed that morning, he realized that I had a lot of objections to the text we were discussing and to the interpretations that other people in the class offered. He got a bit exasperated and he finally said to me, you know, it's okay, we're Presbyterians. We want you to ask questions. It's good to question your faith. And 
everybody in the class just kind of, there was sort of a stifled, muffled kind of he he going through the room, not quite laughing, but sort of like, oh, okay, preacher doesn't get it yet. Uh, and I said to him, look, I'm not questioning my faith. I'm questioning yours. And at that point, everybody in the class cracked up. <laughs> um, I don't think he understood what happened, but the rest of the gang was definitely in on it at that point. Now, I stopped going to church after about three or four years, thinking that my son had all the indoctrination that he needed at that point. Um, I'm pleased to report that he can uh, tell the difference between fact and fantasy, just like his mama can. And I'm also pleased to report that he does not have an imaginary friend. So nevertheless, no one's status as an atheist is a personal attack on anybody else's faith. And I'm one of about a billion people who don't believe in one or more divine beings that created the universe and natural laws or that otherwise affect nature or the lives of my species. I'm an atheist. And that's okay because we're supposed to question our non-belief, right? That's my member story for today. We at the Arkansas Society of Free Thinkers want you to share your story, just like I shared mine and like Byrne shared his. Share your story or a part of it at future meetings in our Free Thought of the Day, in our Skeptics sidebar, or our member story. You have something to share and we want to hear from you. Um, the Arkansas Society of Free Thinkers is a diverse organization with members who represent a wide range of opinions. We invite speakers um, from all different uh, walks of life who we think will be interesting and make us think. Today, um, the president of the Arkansas Society of Free Thinkers, Chris Berecki, is going to be speaking. He's going to be speaking as himself, not as the Arkansas Society of Free Thinkers, but he's going to have some stuff that make us think. Um, Chris works as a healthcare project manager that uh, leads cross-functional teams, whatever that means, with, without formal authority. So I guess he's not a fascist. Um, his educational background includes social psychology, political psychology, and economics. He's particularly interested in the economics of religion and how transactions of tangible and intangible benefits occur within group contexts. In today's presentation, he'll explore how successful grassroots movements of the past and present motivated their members to endure the costs of organization, even when the group's objectives took decades to accomplish, and even when it looked like no progress was being made. We'll learn about the collective action problem, organizational freeloaders, and the countermeasures organizations use to make themselves worth the effort of their members. Chris, thank you. Thanks for the introduction, Anne. So yeah, uh, I thought that, you know, maybe this would be a good time given all the uh, uproar and, and rapid change. The Supreme Court has overturned um, decades of precedent in, in just this session. Um, you know, Roe versus Wade overturned. Um, church state separation basically all but overturned. Um, a lot of, you know, campaign finance, everything uh, rapidly changing. And, you know, we've had um, elections in recent years where that same feeling of vertigo is happening, where, you know, a lot is uh, changing at the same time. And, and there's talk of democratic backsliding, that the, the quality of our governance may not be what it used to be. And it, it may be that we are heading toward the sort of autocracy that people in places like Hungary, Russia, and Turkey endure. And there's also been a lot of talk about how civil society is the backbone of democracy and how you can't really have a democracy without a couple of things involved informed citizens and, uh, and journalism. And a lot of that has changed recently. A lot of that's different. So today, I was going to talk to you um, about some of the stuff that I've picked up over the years. Um, one item I thought was really interesting is something called the collective action problem. Um, and also, you know, maybe take another look at the history of progress 
as we've known it throughout the Enlightenment and, and see, is there another way to analyze this or another way to think about it other than the way that we've been taught? And probably if you, you know, went through a history class in school, you learned that uh, change occurred because of leaders, right? Uh, George Washington and Benjamin Franklin led the American Revolution and, and then, you know, uh, William Lloyd Garrison and Frederick Douglass led the abolition movement. And then, you know, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony led the suffrage movement and uh, Martin Luther King led the civil rights movement. And, but, but the problem with expressing history that way is it makes it sound like if you just had the leaders, all these people appear, all these, you know, organized people just come together and automatically, you know, I guess the market takes care of itself. They all have a, a shared interest and organization magically happens, which, which allows uh, the progress that they're trying to seek to automatically happen. But there's nothing automatic about it. I'm less interested in the leaders, I mean, to whom we owe a great deal, but I'm less interested in why the leaders led than I am in why the followers followed. Um, every one of the organizations that led to progress in the past had to have followers. And so uh, let's see what we can find out about this. Of course, as you go back farther in the past, um, information gets more scarce. But one thing we do know is that modern science, a lot of it came out of the Royal Society in London. You know, Isaac Newton and all the, some of the most, you know, famous scientists ever, you know, watch a few episodes of Cosmos if you doubt the influence of this organization. But in their own time, this is how their critics uh, portrayed them. And I think we can learn something about how their critics were portraying them because uh, somebody saw something like this happening and decided to mock them and say that they were this way in a cartoon. Uh, maybe the history that is unwritten is that you know, these early scientists and philosophers were friends. Uh, maybe they drank beer together and had feasts. Maybe they had a good time and enjoyed being uh, members of the Royal Society or in that social circle just something to think about. Maybe the, the founders of modern science, um, maybe modern science was founded on friendships like this. And there were certainly rivalries in that organization as well, but uh, you see at least a glimpse there. Let's talk about the American Revolution. Um, how did we get the support of France? How did uh, Benjamin Franklin, Grand Master of the Masonic Lodge in Philadelphia, go to France and uh, automatically have a lot of friends on his side. Nine signers of the Declaration of Independence, at least nine that we know of, were Freemasons. And um, those connections gave them the confidence in each other and, and to be able to say, we're going to go to war against our dictator. They knew each other. They had a secret society already, and that kind of translated into what would come next. If you want to know where America was founded, it was in a bar. It was in a series of bars, and some of these bars still exist. You can go to New England and visit them. Uh, these places were pubs in the Revolutionary War era, and pubs back then played a different role than your typical bar right now. Uh, a lot of these pubs were, you know, places where the whole community met. They, they were places where the um, it was the only secular space that you had. It was this or church, right? So uh, think about that when we think about creating our own secular meeting spaces. It's where people would meet up with customers and potential employers. Um, also pubs back then doubled as the post office. So the way that you communicated with the outside world, it went through the pub. And uh, in a world where most people were illiterate, uh, you'd have, you know, literate people reading the news to the illiterate people and some editorials along with that, maybe some, maybe some Thomas Paine along with that. And so these pubs became places um, where ideas were shared and where people started becoming organized. And eventually you go from the pub to this. Eventually you have, you know, dedication and organization and, you know, enough sacrifice of resources that people are willing to you know, work together and trust one another and, and raise an army to free their nation. Let's fast forward to the uh, abolition movement. You know, we, we see these advertisements in old newspapers from the time 
and we talked they were there were presentations and stuff just like what we're doing today and uh, people telling their stories people um, sharing their opinions but what i want to know is you know who organized this stuff it takes a lot of work to you know create a great anti-slavery demonstration like this uh, think about how miserable this must have been to attend. You got standing room only, you're, you're wearing stuffy 19th century clothes. Um, you can, you got no amplification, no air conditioning, maybe no heat. Uh, it's dim, it's smoky. Uh, I mean, you know, would you attend this? I don't know. And then you've got to listen to this speaker at the very front of the room who's not even amplified. So uh, people were, you know, really sacrificing a lot to uh, participate in the abolitionist movement and what you see is that um, it's not just about these big meetings and it's not just about the leaders it's about over a thousand individual chapters of anti-slavery societies all around what was then a very small country um, it's it's about over 250,000 members showing up donating volunteering their time um, it's those members and their experiences and their sacrifices that I'm interested in. Why did they show up? It, it wasn't because the, the leaders snapped their fingers and just made it so. It's not like that they were such wonderful leaders that, you know, they say a few words and all these people show up and everything around an organization just happens by clockwork because let me tell you, I, I, I wish that were the case. But um, here's a, a photo that I really like from the abolition era. And almost all photos from that time were really carefully staged, and this one's less so. And you can kind of see that you've got this really diverse coalition of people who have come together around an ideal. And, you know, maybe they don't all agree with each other. Maybe they've got their internal frictions and whatnot. But you know what? They're a unit, uh, and these people look like friends. They're doing stuff together. They're making change happen, and they are enjoying every minute of it despite their long faces that was just a look back then i guess let's fast forward to the suffragette movement uh look who has the podium now uh, exactly the people who are being disfranchised what has the organization uh, given to these women they've given them a platform for political change and what's the audience doing the audience members are all you know chit-chatting and you know turning to one another they're building friendships and relationships as well and so the organization is, it's got this goal of women's suffrage that's gonna take 50 years to accomplish, but down there in the audience, um, up there with the leaders, people are becoming friends and people are having a good time. And this is kind of what it's all about. This is how they sustain that effort across a couple of generations. I mean, we think of political activism uh, as something that, you know, you, some college kids do in their, you know, junior and senior year. Um, the, talk about 50 years. And when you look at, you know, the current Supreme Court, when you look at the, uh, the power of the religious right right now, I, I think that we need to be thinking way long term. We need to be thinking more like, what are we going to do to build an organization like the National Women's Suffrage Association? that can endure that long, that can keep people's interests, even when there doesn't seem to be any progress happening, even when setbacks are happening every day, people are getting into arguments and, and whatnot, um, what keeps them together? Because it's an endurance race, not a sprint to the finish. Here's a picture of some of the leaders. Um, and you, know, you can't really tell, this is a very staged photograph, but I get the sense that these people knew each other well, that they were friends, that they did stuff together. And, um, and I, I can only imagine that that would be the case, that that's what helped them to, to push on, to keep going when there was no uh, hope in sight, so to speak. Uh, they had to have enjoyed each other's company and what they were doing. And I'm sure there were frictions, just like in every workplace, just like in every organization. But these, uh, this picture of you know, women in the suffrage movement they don't really look like they're having a bad time, but they're doing very hard work. I mean, if you had to pay people to, to do this, how much would you have to pay them? But, but here they are, they're accomplishing something together and you get the sense that they're cooperative. You got the one helping the other with the, 
the, you know, the glue bucket and the signs and, you know, they're, they're just kind of in this cooperative arrangement. And I don't think that that looks like a bad time at all. So when you think about doing the work and how hard it's going to be, um, you know, think about kind of some of our intellectual forebears here. When you do enough of the work, you get institutions. Um, you build up, you know, from you know local meetings and to little local chapters to um, local activities, and eventually you pull your resources together and you can build institutions like this. Next thing you know, you have an office in Washington D.C. and you're making um, a difference at the national level. And this is what it looks like to be on the cusp of victory. Let's fast forward over to the labor movement. Um, this is another era when it was not common to smile for pictures, but do these people look like they're having a miserable time? Uh, they're out there in the cold, standing on the sidewalk, holding signs, but, uh, but guess what? You could tell they're friends. You can tell they work together and that they're in this together. They support each other, they trust each other. And, uh, and here they are making a difference um, in their lives. Um, how much fun would it have been to attend this union picnic? Now you, if you Google, you know, say Google something about a union, you'll find strikes and you'll find, you know, uh, all this stuff and, and laws against unions and blah, blah, blah. But uh, back in 1906, it was about this picnic. It was not just a work society to get more money out of the employer. It was also a, a social group. And look at these uh, activities under great sports program. You got foot races, you've got bicycle races, tug of war. I mean, you know, a picnic with all these games involved, it's not what you think of when you think of unions today. But unions today still have picnics. Um, I found this uh, article in this photo of an AFL-CIO picnic, and the headline was, Candidates Flock to AFL-CIO Labor Day Picnic. Uh, political candidates. So here we have uh, these people, they're enjoying the companionship of one another. They're enjoying um, the social infrastructure that they have built. And they're, they're meeting up with their coworkers and, and having a good time. They've got the whole families out. Their kids are making friends with each other. And, uh, and it's all because of the union that they're part of. But something else is happening too. You've got, uh, you know, aspirant politicians working the crowd, trying to, you know, win their votes, trying to, you know, impress them. And that's political power. These people may only may look like they're, uh, you know, just, you know, munching on food, but they're flexing their political muscles, too. Um, this is something that they could not have accomplished without organization. And the old saying is, um, you know, individually, we, we beg, together, we bargain. And uh, at this point, you know, when you've got a crowd like this and an organization like this, uh, you're the one telling the political uh, leaders what to do instead of the political leaders telling you what to do. Let's fast forward to the LGBTQ rights movement. This is one of the only, um, you know, liberal movements in the last several decades that has had, you know, great success and hasn't, you know, lost ground. In fact, the LGBTQ movement has been extraordinarily successful. They went from, you know, the, um, you know, riots in New York around the, um, oh, what's it called, pub, to, you know, having fully legalized marriage and anti-discrimination laws within a generation. So, I mean, that never happens. You think about it, I mean, that was still another 50-year slog, and uh, it may be that they have a lot more fighting yet to do for their rights, but the point is, is that people were, who were willing to have, you know, meetings, people who were willing to organize and lead and work um, were the ones who enabled you know, the success and the fun. So, uh, and the LGBTQ rights movement has always been about fun. If you notice that, uh, these people in these pride parades, they're having fun. And I suspect that that attitude extends to the, uh, the grassroots organizing as well. So you have to put in the work in order to have the benefits, but, you know, make it fun, make it lighthearted. Um, and so, while they seem to have gotten it and gotten the point, there seems to be this lost technology uh, that we none of us are really aware how to recreate anymore. Uh, how do you, you know, make change? How do you create organizations that endure and that really motivate people? And it's a trade-off because individuals are the ones who make the choice about whether to engage with the organization 
and to what degree they should engage in the organization. And that individual is going to make a decision about how much they're going to you know, engage with the organization based on the value of the benefits. And that value that they expect to get from the organization in terms of benefits has to be greater than the value that they expect to pay in terms of costs. And when we talk about costs, you know, we're in this really capitalistic mindset where we're thinking uh, money like dues, right? But I want you to think psychologically as well. The benefits and the contributions are mostly psychological. It's, it's what is important to you. Um, if you're in an organization, I mean, some of you have been in organizations before, have felt some of this, right? Organizations are a great place to have friendships, like real deep friendships with people who are on the same wavelength as you and have similar interests and values. It's a good place to meet uh, economic or romantic partners. You might find your next employer there, or you might find your next spouse. <laughs> um, it, it's an enhanced self-esteem and sense of identity. A lot of people who are members of organizations, it's really a part of who they are, and that's how they would describe themselves. You can develop new skills in an organization. <clears throat> Go to church sometime, and the person up there um, doing the reading that they you know, rotate through in a lot of churches, that person is learning public speaking, speaking skills. And they have committees where a lot of people, um, maybe even disadvantaged people, are learning organizational techniques and management. Uh, organizations give you a political voice, as we saw with the AFL-CIO, and you know, as we saw with every single you know positive progressive change that has ever happened, it has to be through organization. Um, there's never been a situation where a bunch of individuals, you know, I guess hitting like on Facebook or sharing something, um, have caused a positive change to happen. <clears throat> organizations are also big on entertainment, arts, and music. Um, there's nothing in the Bible that says that anyone should sing or play an organ in church, but there it is. There's nothing about uh, stained glass or sculpture, but there they are. And uh, you can obtain assistance from fellow members when needed. Uh, think about it. If you needed a ride home from the doctor, how many people do you have on your list that you could call and get that ride home from the doctor? It's a scary situation to be in if you don't have you know, more than one or two people on that list because you may not be taken care of when you need it. Uh, organizations also come with costs, right? And this is where I'm saying, don't just think in terms of dues, also think in terms of, you know, the intangible. There's time commitments and travel costs and things like that, but you also face some reputational risk if the organization does something, you know, stupid, or if one of the members does something stupid and it reflects on you as a member of the organization, guilt by association. Uh, some, or actually most organizations impose rules or norms on their members, you know, uh, telling you how you have to behave in the context of the organization or maybe outside the context. It, this really, really grates on free thinkers a lot. I think the rules that organizations put on us um, and, and we try and we imagine having these sort of, um, you know, libertarian organizations where nobody is told what to do by anybody else and everybody's free and there's no hierarchy. But um, what happens is that such situations often meet a blow up point. Um, there were a number of atheist conferences some years back where they were, uh, they were hit by sexual harassment accusations. And the response was to set up a lot of infrastructure and rules and um, you know, people watching out for each other to prevent sexual harassment from happening during atheist conferences. So uh, this, you know, this idea that we can just move forward with, uh, with our activities and not have any rules or constraints on people you know, you have to at least protect each other from each other. You have to at least have rules and norms of behavior where we're not just shouting at each other's faces or, you know, being mean to each other in uh, other ways. There's interpersonal frictions. Any organization, you're not going get to get along with somebody there, and you're just going to have to deal with it if you're going to be in the organization. Some organizations do hazing, and then, you know, you also have to always ask yourself, could I use this time better? Um, could I use my time and money and energy in a, a way that's more satisfying to me? That's opportunity costs, as, as economists call it. And so the big question that we have, we've got this world full of all these problems. We've got, you know, crime and corruption, and we've got uh, you know, pollution and demogra democratic backsliding and uh, governance issues. And why can't we just solve our problems through cooperative organization? That's the only thing that has ever solved our problems that should be fairly obvious, right? We should just do it. 
it's a little more complicated than that. And I'll have to explain some economic theory to go into why. Um, economists break up the world into four types of economic goods. Um, and the two axes that they're breaking this grid up on are rivalry and excludability. Uh, goods are rivals if, like, if I use it and then no one else can use it. If I, you know, cut down all the trees in the forest, um, then you can't cut down all the trees in the forest. If I, you know, buy the last coach purse on the shelf, then you can't buy the last coach purse on the shelf. But whatever it is, if, if it gets used up, uh, it's a rival good. Some things are uh, low in rivalry. So if we, you know, have a a, a potluck picnic, for example, where everybody's, you know, going to a picnic, actually the picnic gets better the more people show up. Uh, if you, you know, 20 people is more fun than 10 people. Uh, you, you reach some limit, obviously, but there it's low in uh, rivalry because it's not used up. Uh, similarly, you know, it, clean air, for example, if, uh, if we have low pollution and and I get to enjoy clean air that's that's low rivalry because you get to enjoy clean air too we're not going to use it up excludability is if people can be prevented from using it so if I can set up a business and charge money and limit access to the thing or if as a club we can say you're you're either in the club or not and if you're not in the club you can't enjoy the benefits you can't uh, attend the party or whatever then then it's excludable and so uh, private goods are both rivalrous and excludable because, you know, there's only so many of them and we can, you know, hold, we can prevent people from having them unless they're willing to pay. So everything at Walmart is a private good. Uh, common resources is, is kind of like uh, shared items that um, are rivalrous. That is, if somebody can take it away from you before you get it, but it's also not excludable. That is, it's available to anybody. And these are common, commonly things that get used up and, and it's an ecological issue as well. Uh, free parking spots are an economist's favorite example because you can't exclude anybody from the free parking, um, but it's very much rivalry because you, if you don't get the free parking, somebody else might and you taking it takes it away from somebody else. What I'm interested in is club goods, goods that are excludable, but also low in rivalry. Uh, this is like, you know, kind of a free lunch in, in a sense of these things that are low in rivalry. We can produce as much as we want of a lot of these items. And, and club goods are things that are produced by the organization. They are the benefits of organizational membership that we just went over, right? The, the friendships, the political voice, the learn new skills, the meet, you know, and network with people that you might want to meet. So club goods are, are valuable because you can do all that stuff um, if you're in the club. Uh, clubs often exclude people who are not in the club from enjoying the benefits because, you know, those benefits are hard to produce, and we'll go into more of that. And then public goods are things like that can be enjoyed by everybody that, um, you know, don't get exhausted. Things like good governance, things like uh, clean air and, uh, you know, information that's posted online for free on Wikipedia. Those are public goods. Okay, so I know that was real... Uh, econ 101, but this is important because what we're seeing is with change-making organizations, like those organizations that I went through earlier, what they were doing is they had, they were offering club goods to their members. That's how they they motivated their member to, to participate on a daily basis for decades, for decades. They were able to sustain that motivation because every day and every time you show up, you get something out of the group. Uh, you get uh, some benefit of group membership. Your life is better than it would be otherwise. Your life is transformed by the, the presence of friends and the uh, enjoyment of the work that you're doing. But the end goals of the organization are not the same thing as what motivates people on a daily basis. The end goals are, you know, something like women's suffrage, something like the abolition of slavery, something like LGBTQ rights, something like civil rights. And those end goals might take you know, it might take forever to, to try to go and try to get. And so it's kind of naive to expect people to pursue those end goals of the organization that are really big and really ambitious and that you might not even see progress for, for a very, very long time. People have a very hard time continuing to invest, you know, money, energy, reputation, time 
uh, into organizations when those end goals aren't being achieved in any time soon. Uh, you, maybe you're not even seeing any any movement, any progress. You know, maybe that's what you really want, but you're just slugging through and, you know, you're miserable working all the time and you're not seeing it. People have a hard time maintaining organizational commitment. And so what the successful organizations do is that they provide those club goods that motivates people on a daily basis. Um, there's lately been a, a rise of what I'll term pseudo organizations. Um, that includes Facebook groups, Twitter hashtags that everybody can pile onto and have a conversation about a topic. Um, then you've got the forums like Reddit, 4chan, 8chan, Discord. Um, a lot of those have turned into really, um, you know, right wing troll nests. Uh, political social media like Truth Social and Telegram are coming out, and, and you know those are really you know these pseudo organizations to pull in like minded people. And so compared to joining a club, uh, these you know you just download the app for free, and then you interact with the app for free. It's got minimal cost of participation. You still got a time commitment, but you know it's it's fun, right? It's not really time spent, but it's fun. So it's like the cost is free. Um, you're pseudo-anonymous, so you can just say or do anything you want with no accountability or anything. And that's not true in a group that you physically show up to. If you show up to a physical meeting group and you just completely act like a jerk, uh, then you're going to have social consequences for that behavior. Online, oh well, pick another forum or pick another username, whatever, it doesn't matter. You can do anything you want. You can also be anyone you want. Let's talk about some of the things that we don't know about people that we meet online on Facebook or in some forum. We don't know if they are who they say they are, their real name. We don't know where they are, what country they're in or anything. We don't know their, their, their gender or sexual orientation, despite what they say. We don't know if um, they are a human or a bot. I mean, think about that. You don't know if somebody's a human or a bot. And this is obviously a barrier to trust and maybe kind of an upper limit on what we can accomplish through these pseudo organizations. And yet, um, despite those limitations and despite you know several other dissatisfactory things like we've experienced with Zoom today, um, pseudo organizations have been very successful at stealing market share, so to speak, from clubs. What they're doing is they're taking things that used to be club goods and converting them into public goods. They're taking things that used to be only available from you know behind the walls of clubs after you've paid your dues and done your you know contribution volunteered and everything else and making it free so now you can just you know share information chit chat with people network and be entertained by an endless stream of videos um, for free and there is no cost and people used to have to you know either join an organization or you've got nothing to to do those things but thanks to electronic media uh, all this stuff is now free and it's moved from being excludable to not being excludable. Um, so, you know, why pay for club goods when you can get them for free? And so tech is eating up organizations. All these organizations on the left, uh, they're in some form of decline. They're, they're struggling with membership. They're struggling with keeping people motivated. And, and it's because uh, the technology platforms are offering a, a kind of cheaper version of the benefits that were formerly only available as club goods. Instead of paying dues and going to meetings and you know, dealing with difficult people, just download this app and you can get the benefits for free. And so um, that includes you know, your social interaction, your entertainment. Internet's really good at entertainment. Uh, networking, um, you can meet people this way, for example, through dating apps or through uh, professional networking apps like LinkedIn. Um, and you can also get even a sense of identity. Some of these people on you know, 4chan and Reddit that are you know, forming these militant groups uh, and forming these really you know, toxic um, sort of identities around themselves, around these chat boards, they're, they're getting a sense of identity from that and that contributes to their self-esteem in a way, even if it is toxic. And so um, the people who might have in an earlier generation uh, joined Rotary or Masons or Junior League or, you know, that volunteered for their union, um, today they're, that generation is, you know, tapping things into Reddit. And so all those, all that, you know, physically meeting uh, 
civic involvement organizations, they're, they're in decline. And a lot of this is summarized in uh, Robert Putnam's book, um, Bowling Alone. And that was from 1999. And he was noticing this trend and it has only increased since then. Um, so apps are, apps are a cheap way to get kind of a lower quality experience for these cup club goods. So, hey, simple solution. Uh, why don't these real life groups just lower their costs? You know, don't charge expensive dues. Don't, you know, try to set rules about people's behavior or norms or anything like that. Just lower the cost. And the reason that you don't want to lower the costs when you're a physically meaning organization, it's the same reason that uh, you don't want to go to a nightclub with no cover charge. Would you rather go to a nightclub with no cover charge or a nightclub with a $10 cover charge? Because let me tell you, the crowd that shows up will, will be completely different. <laughs> uh, any cost is going to filter out some of the people who would, you know, be non-committed to the success of the organization. Um, and that's an important thing because when you have free riders, the people in the organization who are just there to get the benefits but don't really contribute anything back, uh, that really saps the morale of the dedicated volunteers. And I, I see this actually in my work every day. It's the old 80-20 principle that 80% uh, of the effects are due to 20% of the causes and 20% of the people make 80% of the difference. And that's the best it gets in organizations. That's, that's the way it is uh, anywhere. Everything that we've accomplished in humanity dis is despite that rule, not, uh, not because 100% of people were all doing the best they could. But, uh, but yeah, high costs, you know, keep those free riders out and, uh, and keep the morale up actually. And if you've paid a high cost to, to get into an organization and, and you've really sacrificed and done all you could, you're probably not gonna be the person who uh, sabotages the organization, even if it is in your short-term benefit to do so. Um, if you've worked really hard and you really are dedicated, then you know, maybe you're not going to embezzle the money. Maybe you're not going to you know, sexually harass your fellow members. Maybe you're not going to you know, do all these obnoxious behaviors that maybe you think is satisfying for you, but would be really bad for the group. And so uh, real meeting organizations have something of a floor on the lowest cost that they can charge and, and accomplish. And so now we get to the collective action problem. Um, it was uh, described by an economist named Mankur Olson back in 1965. And the idea is that, you know, individuals sometimes face a choice. We're getting into some game theory stuff now, kind of like the, uh, the prisoner's dilemma, if any of you are familiar with that, but this is sort of the organizational version of the prisoner's dilemma. An individual can obtain more benefits by acting selfishly uh, sometimes than they could through group cooperation. And so, you know, you're, you're weighing the benefits as a, an economic creature and you're trying to figure out, should I cooperate with the group or should I, um, you know, try to get what I can out of it and, and bail on them? And as the group grows, you know, when, when you have a, a five person group, uh, it's, it's one thing to try to be the freeloader. If you've got a hundred person group, it's a whole other thing because when you've got a big group, the organization's producing more benefit, um, you're attracting more free riders, and it's maybe a little, little easier to be that free rider when you're a member of a very large group. Their responsibility is diffused. The group's probably going to win without, um, you know, your help if you don't help. So it'll be all right. Just go and get your benefits, right? Here's an example. Let's say that at your new job, you have the option to join a union and it's going to cost you $1,000 a year. Unions are actually very expensive, a thousand bucks a year. 90% uh, of your coworkers are already in the union. And so you decide not to pay the cost because you'll probably enjoy the benefits anyway. This place is 90% unionized. Um, if the union negotiates higher pay, then you'll get the higher pay too. And, you know, you'll not have to put in your $1,000. So that is the optimum solution for you. Just like uh, in the prisoner's dilemma, defecting on your partner is the optimum solution. It's the decision that leaves you with the highest payoff regardless of what happens. And so the collective action problem is, uh, it, it's a big deal for groups. And uh, if anybody has ever done a, uh, a group project in school, this is what it looks like. And I think a lot of us, in this group are really sharp and we relate to the person who did 99% of the work and had to deal with the people who, uh, oh, I have no idea what's going on and, you know, I'm going to help and then doesn't show up. And then this other person who just ghosts on the project 
you know, and isn't seen again to the end. Uh, this is kind of what it's like to be an organization. And I, I've always wondered, I think it may be why teachers assign group work so that, you know, you can, um, if you want to, if you want to be this person who does 99% of the work and gets the A, you're going to have to put up with these three slackers on your team who uh, have noticed that you're the smartest, hard, hardest working one, and they're going to get that A with you uh, just by slacking off and letting you do all the work. So, so yeah, free riders are a big problem, but the question is, if group projects, um, if everybody got an F by default, completely failed the class by default, but you had the option to pay $100 to get into a group that has a chance of, you know, getting a passing grade, uh, would you pay that $100? Yeah, you would, because it makes sense. That's less than the cost of tuition if the choice is to fail or not. But would you be more committed having paid that $100? Probably so. Probably these free riders would be a little more motivated. Um, and so as everybody has gone online and how everybody is now using these, you know, apps to do things that they used to, to use clubs to do, uh, something has happened. Um, you noted, noted that I said that on these apps, you don't really often have the chance to build the sort of close interpersonal friendships that you had, you know, in physically meeting groups. You don't really get to know anybody. You, you're, you're both got these pseudonymous uh, handles instead of real names, and you don't even know if the other person is their real name. You, you're not sure who you're interacting with. Even if it's somebody you know in real life, you see their name and their profile picture on Facebook and you're interacting, you don't know if their account's been hacked. You might be talking to anybody in the world. So uh, there's this, this trust barrier. There's this you know, closeness issue. And, uh, and people aren't as close to each other as they are anymore. Look at how many people uh, in 1990, this is you know, within our lifetimes, in 1990, uh, a third of people had 10 or more close friendships, not counting relatives, and these are close friendships. And, and look at how the tables have turned. Uh, just last year, 12% of people had no friends, zero friends. Like they are the ones that if they needed to go to get a ride back from the doctor, there's nobody that would do that for them. There's nobody who even knows where they live, cares about them, that kind of thing. And, you know, a lot more people have just one or two close friends. And this is a reversal of the norm. This is a reversal of the way uh, I would suggest that life has always been, where people were social creatures. And um, it, it's really kind of an epidemic, a, a mental health epidemic. And I would argue that a lot of these people with none, one or two friends, they're probably spending a lot of time on technology and, a, and not a lot of time in physically meeting groups. And so um, here's your uh, psychology pop quiz question today. What is closely correlated with the number of friends that a person has? The answer is uh, their suicide risk. The, this chart's a little blurry and I apologize for that, but the total number of suicides in the United States really started taking off at about the point where we uh, began using the internet for our social lives. It really started taking off around you know, 2001, 2002, uh, Facebook and MySpace are coming out. And then you know, 2007, the iPhone comes out and the curve gets even steeper, even steeper. And so that time that we're spend, spending, you know, when your iPhone reports you spent three hours today on it and that your average daily time is three or four hours, that time came out of somewhere. It came out of time that in a different generation you might have used to, with your friends. Um, let's look at adolescent suicides. You know, again, starting at 2007, the introductory date of the iPhone, look at how high it's gone. Look at, look at this. It's more than doubled, more than doubled the suicide rate. Something radical uh, is occurring in our society that would cause a metric like this to move this fast. You would think you know, if somebody in 2007 had seen this chart from the future, they would think that maybe there was like this great depression scenario or something. Maybe people were starving or miserable or uh, aliens attacked or whatever. Um, but uh, no, it's, it's just that I think it's related to people don't have any friends now and that's normal. So I think that the market is ripe for change making organizations to exist in the real world. This is a lot of depressing stuff, right? This is all, I've just listed all the reasons why uh, organizations aren't working. But coming out of the pandemic, 
I think, I think something has clicked in a lot of people's minds that I can't live this way. I can't live my life through, you know, just staring at a screen on the internet or my phone or whatever. Uh, this is no way to be. And certainly some people think it's great. Some, some people are all about it, but I think a large portion of the demographic is looking for a way out of it. And so if I was to, to say advice for an organization, um, don't try to compete with social media. Don't try to compete with, you know, your, your cell phones because that cost is going to keep going down to, to near zero. Those services um, that are provided by social media at, you know, a pretty, pretty low level of quality, those will always be free from now on. And so don't try to lower your cost and compete with them because you're never going to be low enough. That's like trying to set up a retail shop and sell things for cheaper than Walmart does. You're going to fail. Uh, lots of people have failed at that. Um, instead, you know, produce better club goods to justify higher costs. Because remember, you want higher costs. They run off the freeloaders that destroy your group's morale. You want higher costs because an organization that's full of committed people is worth a lot more to the kind of people you want in your organization than an organization full of freeloaders. Um, and so focus on production of club goods that electronic media cannot compete against. They can't give you experiences in reality. They can't give you uh, really close bonds between people. Everything I've seen about the supposedly up and coming metaverse is that it's you know, not going to be much different than a video game uh, experience. And so if we focus on the things that social media and electronic media cannot provide, and we leave behind the things like entertainment or um, you know, information sharing that they can provide, then that gives us an organizational focus. Um, increase the exclusivity of your club goods to deter free riders. Now, a lot of people um, who have egalitarian attitudes don't like this idea, right? This is this is like you know this is like uh, flashbacks from college when all the the people who were cool or whatever had things going on, and had privilege, were the people who paid to be in fraternities. Um, well, this is the way that uh, the organization has to be. Um, if you don't have exclusive club goods, if you don't, um, you know, say you're in or out to some people, then, then yeah, the organization has to cut them off or else um, there's no reason for anybody to be in the organization. And finally, I think that we have to confront those organizational attitudes that I just alluded to head on. Um, we live in a consumeristic world. We're surrounded by advertisements that tell us that everything that we, you know, every bit of money or time that we spend, we, sh we should get something out of it. And we should expect to be happy and get things out of our uh, investments and stuff. And it's, it's kind of this, you know, selfishness that is encouraged by our consumer driven uh, economy and society. We think that if we buy enough things, we'll be happy. Uh, that's not really true. It's if you have enough friends, you'll be happy, regardless of your material level of wealth. Um, some of these ideas are not compatible with, you know, the mutual cooperation and, and mutual sacrifice that are required for the sort of change-making organizations that we saw from the past and present. The ones that are successful are able to keep that wheel turning between, you know, the benefits and the costs, where the benefits to the individual always exceed the costs. And so there's also, though, some cultural values here where we decide what is of value. We decide what's beneficial to us, what's important. And um, to some extent, the organization can advertise its values and say, you know, the thing that's important to us, it's, it's not the money that we spend on dudes. It's not the time we spent driving to all these different places, uh, not the meetings and whatnot. It's the, the bonds. It's the, the fun that we have. And that's the, the main thing right there is that the change making has to be fun. You have to invent this world where doing the hard work of sus and sustaining these efforts um, are going to still be, you know, that model is still going to be around 50 years from now. So if you think about what's going to motivate you to show up every day and work hard for what you believe in, if you think about what's going to motivate somebody else, um, it's got to be this day-to-day short-term benefit, these day-to-day -day club goods that are the motivators that cause you to show up every day and, and do something about your values instead of pursuing the alternative, you know, scrolling through uh, an endless stream of funny videos or 
you know, doing whatever in uh, some forum on the internet. If you spent more money on uh, Amazon Prime Day this year than you have donated to organizations, you might want to think about these values and these expectations because you've been taught to think that you get more uh, benefit from how you spend money and, and, and that any problem you have, you just spend money and solve it. But maybe that's not the case. Uh, maybe you should be thinking about the collective more. And that's really at odds with a lot of the, the current values that we see um, among people who would like to make change happen. And it's those underlying values that might have to change before they are able to um, meet with the organization, contribute to the organization, and sustain that effort for the rest of their lives and their kids' lives. So um, do I think that the world is doomed? No. We face the same challenges that every other or organization has faced through every other generation. Um, people have made things work in much harder circumstances than we will ever face. If you think about the poverty people faced during the abolition era, um, you know they, they, had, they had virtually nothing and it didn't matter to them because they, their way of having fun was getting together with their friends and making change happen. If you think about the discrimination and actually physical violence that the suffragettes faced and, and, the, and also the male suffrage um, advocates faced, I mean, it was, it was just so much intimidation and brutality. And free thinkers may, we may get to that point. Uh, we have it easy now. We can pretty much meet without harassment. We can, you know, don't have to worry about uh, goons follow us, following us around or anything like that. But, you know, you have to think about what if the cost increases? What if the other side increases the costs on you? Um, just like they did for every movement that has ever made significant change. I mean, the civil rights movement, the, you know, the, the labor movement, they all uh, really had to suffer and really had to be dedicated to push through and win. And so it, it'll take a different set of values and it'll take organizations that understand the collective action problem and understand the countermeasures that you can use to, um, to beat that. And so we can you know, go on into questions if y'all would like. weren't expecting a microeconomics lecture. Understood. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. That was really interesting. Yeah, especially with the short notice. Very good. Okay. If uh, Roger had a question of um, how do we make it fun for each other? Uh, <laughs> that's the puzzle, Roger. That, that's the puzzle. And there is no one solution. I mean, I think that uh, there is something to be gained from, you know, looking at the other side of this, looking at the, the people who um, are forming organizations and successfully advocating for the, the rollback of individual freedom. How do they make it fun for themselves when their whole organization is about, you know, harming other people or, or whatnot? And, and that may seem like a, um, an obscene thing to say. It may, it may seem like, you know, why would we borrow from their tactics? But I think tactics are tactics, and tactics uh, in the cultural and, and political sphere, they, they win or they lose. So there's a lot that we can learn from churches. There's a lot that we can learn from, you know, the people who are still standing in the environment of, uh, you know, civil society and, and individual groups out there that are trying to do good things. There's a lot we can learn from uh, the Rotarians and, you know, a lot of the other charitable groups. Um, there's a lot we can learn from fraternal organizations. A lot of them, uh, particularly uh, uh, African American fraternities, they they had to rise in the an environment of really harsh oppression. And a lot of those people would have gotten kicked out of school if their membership in a secret society was revealed or discovered. And and so they had some. They've got some problems that we wouldn't necessarily want to have, but. They've, they've also figured out a way. And, uh, and I think everything's on the table. Um, everything's on the table except losing. And I think that when you, when you see yourself in this position of you know, doing this thing, I want you to, to imagine that that is the position of losing. Um, the position of winning is in a meeting, in, in a uh, cooperative work environment, working on a project together. Uh, that's what winning looks like. And that's what, uh, 
and it's not just winning in a political sphere, it's, it's winning in your personal life because there's nothing that your phone can do for you really except tie you up and use your time. Uh, the thing that you're gonna accomplish in life, the, the fun that you're gonna have, the, the people you're gonna get to know are gonna be in that real world. Hey, Chris? Yeah. Uh, one of the things that I put on the uh, survey that we need to be doing as a group is we need to give people something that says, I am a member of the Arkansas Society of Free Thinkers. And to me, it needs to be something that they get every year. Maybe it's a patch, maybe it's a, an addition to their tattoo sleeve, maybe it's a, a, a membership card. But I think we're missing something by not saying, put, send your, don't, send your uh, dues in by January 31st in order to get your brand new high gloss uh, multicolor membership card with picture of uh, Baphomet on it. <laughs> Yeah, Byrne, that, uh, that actually touches on something that um, in people with a politically liberal mindset in today's um, current world are really uncomfortable with. I don't, I mean, when I see the, uh, the pictures of the women's suffrage movement where they're wearing, you know, bands across um, their bodies saying, you know, that I'm a member of the National Association of whatever, they were not afraid of being identified as part of a group. Uh, they were not afraid of thinking of their personal identity uh, as being a part of a group and, and saying that, you know, I am a, a civil rights activist working with the uh, Southern Christian Leadership Conference. I am right. an abolitionist working with the, uh, you know, uh, I forget the name of the, the, one of the main organizations. But, uh, but yeah, you don't have to get a facial tattoo like uh, members of the MS-13 gang um, to, to be committed, but uh, it, it does affect your sense of identity. Uh, it does affect, it, it does mean that um, you think of yourself as a part of a whole. And if you have a lot of hyper individualistic attitudes, um, then, then that's going to seem a little bit uncomfortable to you. That's going to seem mildly offensive to you. And um, in terms of individualism versus collectivism, the United States is the most individualistic country in the world we all think of ourselves as, uh, as lone rangers out there and the, you know, the economy getting what we want. Um, with rugged general. individualists. Yes, rugged individualists. And, and we, don't, we don't tend to think of ourselves as, as part of a whole, part of a group. You know, other people in other countries, you ask them who they are, they'll tell you that, you know, well, I work for so-and-so company and I'm a member of this family. I am a, a citizen of this city and in this state. And, and you'll say, well, what? I was just asking your name. Uh, people in the United States will say, you know, well, I am someone who drives a Jeep. I am someone who wears Tommy Hilfiger. I am whatever. Um, it, really, you know, who's, what's my identity as an individual um, that makes me different from everybody else? That's that individualism coming out. And so um, to the extent that groups benefit by, or one of the benefits of being in a group is having a sense of identity that you're not this island in the world. You're not that, you know, rugged individual out there that nobody else agrees with. Um, that, that has value to a lot of folks. And, uh, you know, if your whole identity is based on the things that you consumed, um, like it is apparently for a lot of people, I mean, that's, that's kind of, that's kind of shaky ground to stand on and, uh, and being a part of something is, is actually, it, it makes sense at some level. So I'm not saying collectivism is good, but I'm saying we might've taken hyper-individualism a little too far to the point now that we're all staring into our phones, uh, looking at our personalized Facebook feeds and our personal, personalized Twitter feeds and you know, is toning out anything that might cause us to log off of either of those services. And, and we're saying, you know, that this, is, this is what I am. Maybe it's not. Thank you, Chris, so much for that presentation. Um, I hope everybody's enjoyed it. We have learned that the next best use for an iPhone is to calendar our next in-person meeting with someone else <laughs> to make that personal connection. Next month's speaker is going to be Allie Taylor with the Arkansas Abortion Support Network. 
who will update us on the status of abortion rights in Arkansas since the Supreme Court's decision in Dobbs and uh, the upcoming special legislative session that is sure to address abortion on some level or another. Um, we're kind of waiting to see, but she'll be speaking to us in August. To deliver the quality club goods Chris was just talking about, we need volunteers. We need people to help with graphic design and website development, to write letters to stop church state violations, and to host events like potluck, a book club, and family and child-centered activities. If you have skills or ideas to contribute to the cause or want to host a meeting, contact us at info at arfreethinkers.org. Get involved. Come to some of our other events. We have a number of things on the calendar, and with the rising COVID numbers, um, some of them are in person, some of them are outside, some of them are inside, and I'm not sure if they're actually meeting. Um, Vern, is Pint Night actually meeting in person? We're, we're planning on meeting. I've got two people coming. The last <laughs> three nights, I've had no one RSVP, and so at five o'clock, if no one has said they're coming, I've been canceling, but well, I've got two Two women, in fact, uh, okay, they're great. supposed to be there. So great. That's, that's what's happening Monday night. Okay. Well, we've also got Zoom night that will happen. And of course, Heathen Hikers at five o'clock at the Clinton yes. Center. And then uh, on Wednesday, there's the hike at Rock Creek Trail. Every uh, Thursday, there is an online meeting of the Beyond Belief Secular substance abuse recovery group led by Mary Ann Hansen. Um, every Monday, we have Heathen Hikers, Pint Night, and Zoom Night. Uh, on August 2nd, we have First Tuesday, and that's going to happen at, uh, that's going to happen at American Pie Pizza on North Hills Boulevard in North Little Rock. Um, Socrates Cafe is meeting again. Check the calendar. There are some regular uh, monthly meetings at Maumel and at Fletcher Library. And at, uh, I think there's one on Monday nights at Terry Library that we've not put on the calendar because we've got so much else going on. There's also a slot car racing event that is held uh, the first Saturday of every month at two o'clock. Check meet up for that. Um, Leewood is still hosting the disc golf on, uh, I believe, Saturday mornings once a month. And uh, second Sunday, Cantina Communion is happening. Uh, I think that will be meeting in person for anyone who feels comfortable to attend. Other than that, I think that's our meeting for today. I thank everyone for attending and hope to see you next month.